exam? There is no exam. Contrary, yeah, the, they always schedule an exam, but you're free next week. This is the last last meeting. Shh, you're supposed to keep scaring them. Okay, we're ready, Rob. Right, good afternoon, okay. and good afternoon, and welcome to Purdue University and the Serious Computer Security Seminar. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Mark Rogers, professor in computer technology here at Purdue, and former Serious staff member. His topic today will be uh, computer deviance and uh, how understanding individuals who engage in these kind of activities can help lead to better digital investigation. So in this talk, he'll provide some uh, up-to-date research on that topic and introduce a, a process model for digital investigation and analysis. Mark? Thank you, Randy. Good afternoon. As indicated, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, computer deviance, and uh, I'll qualify things right up front. It's a little tricky way of, of really not using the old hack need term, hackers, or computer crime. We're going to really look at, at those characteristics or those individuals that would fall within that category, but we're going to make it a little bit broader. And again, relate it back to this whole concept of digital investigations, digital evidence, and really look at how do we repurpose something to, that, to be quite honest, has been fairly effective, maybe a little controversial, but fairly effective in regular investigative work, how we can repurpose that for the digital crime scene. I always like to start off with a little cartoon. I notice there's quite a few of my students in the class. They, make a, they have probably seen this before on my door. Little, you know, the, the Goss, the Vandals, the Huns. And yes, it's kind of interesting that that does look a little bit like Bill Gates. Oh, the, the very first one. I think the first one's actually Bill's dad. Isn't he, isn't he a corporate lawyer? Little agenda. What is cyber forensics? We're going to set the, uh, a little bit of the tone here. Uh, now, uh, obviously, uh, some of the students in here are going to be familiar, but just to make sure we're all basically on the same wavelength, on the same page, before we jump into really the, the, the discussion. What is a cyber crime? And it might shock you to, uh, to, to, to know that we, uh, we might have some actual interesting, if not false definitions of what is a cybercrime. So we'll look at that. Psychology uh, of a psychological crime scene analysis, relate it back to what we do in the real world, what we do in the physical world, and then look at how do we repurpose that to a digital crime scene. And then look at some investigative uses. With the investigative uses, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some cases we've been working on where we've actually used this process and had some pretty good success. Obviously, uh, I won't be able to get into any specifics, but it'll be kind of a redacted version of this. So what is cyber forensics? Cyber forensics is an emerging scientific discipline. I'm going to use the term emerging. It is relatively new, if you want to compare it to the other forensic sciences that have been around, like latent fingerprint analysis since the 1800s. We've got about a 22 to 23 year history, which makes us a bit of a babe in the woods when it comes to the forensics field. Now, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and go on a limb with the second bullet point. Uh, we have understanding that in the, at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences meeting in San Antonio in 2007, we will have fulfilled the criteria to be recognized as a sub-discipline. Sub-discipline will actually be digital forensic sciences and digital evidence or what we refer to as cyber forensics will be under that subclass. And that is a very important step. If you're looking at the way the courts determine whether something is credible or not, whether something really qualifies as scientific evidence, if you're not recognized by the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, for all intents and purposes, you don't exist in the eyes of the court. It then becomes a, a little bit of a rolling the dice to determine whether this is something that has a higher weight than other factual evidence. Like I, like I mentioned, it falls under the umbrella of digital forensic science, DFS, which is actually broken down into two different subcategories. The first one being IT, or imaging technology, which is a funny term, because really it's referring to multimedia. This includes audio and video. What we're going to talk about today, though, is the digital evidence portion, we call the DE. That includes the media analysis, network analysis, code analysis, and this is where this concept of cyber forensics fits in. If you've read any of the literature, or you've, or you've been online, or you're reading the newspapers, you'll see there's a mixing of terms. Some, some people call it computer forensics. Some people call it cyber forensics. Some people refer to it as network forensics. 
for the purposes of this talk, we're really interested in the digital evidence. So the modality of the evidence is going to define what we're talking about. And in this case, it doesn't matter whether it's in transit, whether it's in storage. As long as it is digital in nature, this is what we're going to be focusing on. Cyber forensics then really deals with these following. It's the secure collection, the identification of, sus of suspect data, examination of this data, the presentation, and application, obviously, of a country's laws to computer practice. That really is kind of defines, in a nutshell, at a very high level, what this area is about. We talk about cybercrime, we might have some misconceptions. Who here has ever watched that show, Mythbusters? Yeah, my son and I love that show. Well, let's do a little bit of, of myth busting here. The media talks about this concept of a computer crime. And as they talk about computer crime like it's a distinct category that's separate from everything else. In fact, computer crimes constitute at least three broad categories. And actually, two of these categories are really not overly unique. You have computer assisted. A computer assisted crime is really where the computer is nothing more than a tool. Child pornography, fraud, um, other type of cases where, the, where really the computer is just used to reach out and if more effectively touch somebody, make it easier to counterfeit, make it easier to commit an act that really doesn't have its genesis in technology, that becomes what we call a computer assisted crime. And we have pretty good experience in dealing with, unfortunately, things like fraud and counterfeiting and child pornography and, and these other cases from the physical world. There's not a lot of new information that we need there. I want to talk about the third one second, computer incidental. In this case, really, this is an artifact of, our, our so, of society's need and demand and reliance on technology. Who here in this room does not own a cell phone? There's always one in every crowd, right? Who here, who here never uses email? Okay, you've just basically uh, illustrated my point. We're all tied to technology, aren't we? Doesn't matter really what we do in life, we have, a, we have these digital trails. Email, we've in fact, uh, last, uh, last metrics I saw is 36 billion pieces of email a day. That's a lot of email. If you look at businesses, 93% of the information that a business has is, is usually digital based or is in digital form. The, they may print it to document, but for the most part, even businesses have gone to digital, to electronic documents now as opposed to the paper. They may make copies, but still, we live in a digital world. And because of that, evidence now related to just about any type of investigation is going to be digital in nature. In fact, the, uh, the FBI indicates that now and in the, not, you know, and in the near future, they figure 80 to 90 percent of all investigations they do, which include a murder, something that really has nothing to do with the computer, will have digital evidence. Again, that's just an artifact that we are tied to the digital world. We use our bank cards. We use our credit cards. We email. We go into MySpace. We go to Facebook. We leave our calendars. We have these, these basically these devices that are a cell phone, PDA, email calendar. We're aiming people. We're IMing people all over the place. This all becomes evidence that may or may not be related to something that's part of an investigation. The second one is computer targeted. And this is the one that we tend to hear a lot more about. These would be things where the actual crime has its genesis in technology. So things like hacking. Things like denial of service attacks. Virus attacks. These type of, of crimes couldn't be committed without the technology, could they? Pretty hard to plant a computer virus if there wasn't any computer viruses. Now, contrary to popular belief, things like identity theft. Identity theft is not a com not really a computer targeted crime. For the most part, it's a computer assisted. Identity theft has been around a lot longer than computers. It just makes it easier. In some cases, however, I'll qualify that. In some cases, it makes it easier for those individuals. Just kill this. Sorry. It makes it easier for those individuals that are involved in it to get information that used to be separated, that used to be in different databases that weren't connected. It makes it easier <laughs> if we turn them off. There's an example of being tied to technology. Come on. There we go. I hope it's off now. No, it's still not off. It's going to turn off eventually. 
So what we really have to look at is at least, like I said, these three different categories. And really, what's common with all these categories is that it has digital evidence in it. So whether it's computer assisted, computer target, or incidental, we're dealing with digital evidence. We're going to usually have a physical crime scene and electronic or digital crime scene. Let's shift gears a bit. That's kind of the background. Let's shift gears a bit and look at this whole concept of forensics and where we're going to go with this whole concept of what we call psychological crime scene analysis. So let's back up the bus a little bit and kind of go forensics 101. I will not call it CSI 101. Anybody says CSI gets something thrown at them. Actually, it's a little poll. Who here does not watch CSI? Oh, I like this crowd already. Really, the, the, the common element for forensics or criminalistics, which is another fancy term for forensics, is this principle of exchange from Edmund Lacard. And really what this says is when a person commits a crime, something is always left at the scene of the crime that was not present when that person arrived. You're exchanging. We commonly think of this as far as, as physical evidence, right? A crime scene, what do you see on the CSI shows that nobody watches? Fingerprints, right? Always want to get fingerprints. DNA. Blood samples. You might want to get uh, uh, footprint imprints. You might want to look at tire treads. There's all these different things that happen. You have this exchange of physical. Now, this whole concept of psychological crime scene analysis, and I'm, I'm purposely avoiding the word profiling, because profiling has a very negative connotation. We've kind of moved from the days of being profiling to the days of it's now. Profiling is something that may be you know, a little bit too close to the argument between, you know, is it, uh, is it astrology versus astronomy? Is one an art versus a science? We're going to use the concept of psychological crime scene analysis. It's profiling, but it's, a slightly, it's slightly different. And part of the principles of that is, yes, this principle of exchange that Lacard has suggested is true, but it's not just true for the, psychologic, or for the physical. It's true for the psychological. And these two other things have to happen here. The core of our personality doesn't change over time. And that's been tested, that's been researched, and for the most part, that's true. You don't wake up one day, be one type of person, and the next day be completely different. You might have peaks and valleys when you're grouchy, when you're happy, when you're sad, but for the most part, your personality after a certain age is fairly stable, is fairly set. There are some artifacts, there are some I guess, uh, effects of aging, but that doesn't change this drastically for our purposes. The other, as I mentioned, is the fact that this principle of exchange holds true for the psychological as well as the physical. But not only do we leave fingerprints and footprints and DNA behind, we leave a piece of our psyche behind. We leave a piece of our personality. We leave a piece of our characteristics behind. And that's the information that we're going to look at not just in the physical, we're also going to look at that for that kind of information in the digital, because it does exist there if you know where to look for it. As I mentioned before, uh, this whole concept of psychological profiling is really where this stuff kind of started out. And to be honest, psychological profiling is not new. It's been around for a long time. Psychological profiling, uh, probably some of the most famous uh, instances where Jack the Ripper, and there's a whole genre of books out there for what they call ripperologists, people who study Jack the Ripper. Who here has never heard of Jack the Ripper? Okay, good. Just before you know, I want to make sure they're on the same page here. Never caught, right? How many different theories are there out there who this person was? What, have, what, have, what has anybody heard? I've heard it. Some books claimed it was the Queen's uh, doctor. Others claim it was a member of the royal family. Others have claimed that it was uh, uh, basically some that owned a tannery in the area. There's multiple different profiles of who this individual was. And again, never caught. Now, the psychological profiling then is really the art and science of developing a description of a criminal's characteristics, physical, intellectual, and emotional. And it's basically it's based on the collection of evidence at the scene. Contrary to the Hollywoodization of this, it has never, it doesn't allow you to go through a room of people and say, it's him. That's the person. That is Hollywood hype. 
What it does do is help you reduce the potential number of suspects and provide kind of a concentration for the investigation, which in and of itself is extremely useful. If you think about it, does anybody know of any law enforcement agencies that have an unlimited amount of manpower, an unlimited budget? It doesn't exist. Those multi-billion dollar labs with you know, a person who's got a PhD, each, each person has nine PhDs in nine different areas, that's Hollywood. That doesn't exist. There's a finite amount of, of resources, both economic and manpower, to put on one of these cases. So you haven't got time to look for everybody. You need to narrow that down. It does not replace good old-fashioned police work. It is seen as a tool, as an investigative tool. It's not a replacement. So that's the context that we need to keep in mind. A little bit of uh, psychology 101 here is there's actually three different types of profiling. You have your inductive base, your deductive base, and your hybrid. Inductive is general to the specific. This is probably the one that you're most familiar with if you've read any of the books, if you've seen any of the shows like uh, uh, Mindhunter, or you've seen, uh, there's been a couple one, um, Red Dragon, Silence of the Lambs. The FBI's dichotomous model, where you've got basically, you've got organized and disorganized offenders. And that came about from a very long study that went out and interviewed these individuals who had been convicted of, of crimes, certain crimes. They interviewed them, gave them a battery of tests, put these into basically a statistical analysis, and looked at what popped out, what trends. It's really going from the general down to a specific individual that you're looking for in a case. And, of course, there's issues with this because the database they use was primarily culturally constrained, which means North America, U.S. only. And this day and age, when travel is, is, is pretty easy, there's nothing to basically jump on a plane and go to some other country. And it's really not a good idea to have a culturally biased uh, sample to try and make, uh, basically, you're trying to use that to extrapolate out to individuals that may or may not be from that particular culture. So again, though, it's a model that was one of the first. You have the deductive or case base. This is often referred to as behavioral evidence analysis. This is slightly different. This is looking at a case by case, basically specific to specific. It is really dealing with information, a lot of information. You basically have to get information from the people that took the pictures at the scene, the individuals that were there, the crime scene technicians. You put all this information together and out the other end, you hope, pops out a pretty good picture of who that specific individual is. Now, some of the literature tries to, claims that these are two mutually exclusive processes. And that's not really true. I don't know of many people that just use one in basically and don't even bother looking at the other. For the most part, you have the hybrid approach. In the hybrid approach, you start with a large funnel. Large end of the funnel. You start with, you have multiple different uh, possible suspects you're looking at. Quite often, you use the inductive process to narrow it down to something that's a little more manageable. Once you have it narrowed down, then you move to the deductive, and you start looking at what we call salient case points, start pointing you even going from here to here, and hopefully down the funnel to here. And this is when it becomes useful. This is when it has some utility for investigators. An interesting timeline, and it doesn't show up very well, showing the, basically the, the computer criminal typology determination goes back to uh, Jack the Ripper. This actually came from one of the master's students over in the School of Technology, uh, Noble Dean, did his master's thesis on this. He charted really the development through the ages of criminal taxonomies, of the psychological crime scene analysis, and where it's ended up to today. We go from Jack the Ripper all the way up to basically Cantor and the investigative psychology, Brent Turvey and the behavioral uh, evidence analysis. And I'd say 2004, 2006, we're now moving into going from traditional criminal activities to the cyber digital. So that's kind of where we are right now. Part of the psychological crime scene analysis then, or we, call to, uh, we refer to as PCSA, is looking for important elements. What do investigators need? What assistance can we give investigators? Well, one is obviously the motive. Why did the person commit that crime? Is there evidence at the scene that would allow us to make that determination? What was their MO? We always hear MO, right? Every cop show, it's, oh, what was their MO? 
Well, that's another tool. That's another artifact. That's another piece of the puzzle we can use. We've got signature behaviors or aspects which help us focus in on the who. We have something called staging behaviors. Contrary to popular belief, criminals can read. They can read these reports. In fact, they've ran into some situations, especially with the dichotomous offender profiling that was very common with the FBI in the early days, is they had this concept of this organized offender. The organized offender was highly intelligent, highly motivated. Well, what they found out was a lot of these highly motivated, highly intelligent uh, people they were investigating knew the model. So they would try to make the scene look like it was disorganized because they had the checklist. Oh, if I do this, if I do that, it's going to make it look like it was disorganized. So a way of kind of fooling this. Also, somebody that was under the influence of drugs, alcohol, who's an organized offender, all of a sudden that crime scene looks disorganized, doesn't it? Because they're, they're, and they're impaired at that point in time. So staging kind of makes you look at maybe who didn't do it. If there's evidence of staging, hmm, that may be not really that type of person. We also have to look at the victimology, or to whom. These are all elements that we look at. For the most part, the signature behaviors is the one that probably give us the most reliable information on, on the, those personality characteristics. MO can be learned. MO is usually learned. MO can tell you maybe where they, a person is in, in their career or within the maturity within that criminal trade craft. People early in the career usually don't have very effective MOs. As they get caught, go to jail, get educated by the, by the people in jail that says, no, don't do it that way. Do it this way next time. They come out the other end a little more educated, and their MOs changes slightly. Signature behaviors, on the other hand, are behaviors that are not necessarily learned, but are those behaviors which really help that person satisfy those urges, those drives, those desires. It's what they get the kick from. They commit some of these activities that we're going to be talking about simply for the kick, and the signature behaviors are those behaviors which allow them to satisfy that need. It's not learned. A lot of cases are not even aware they're doing that. Signature behaviors would be an example in the physical world would be the scenarios they have the victims play out, the way they dress their victims, the script that they have with their victim. Those are part of, of satisfying this perverse need, this perverse drive, and nothing to do with being successful. In some cases, the signature behavior is stealing certain artifacts, certain trophies. Well, stealing a trophy from a victim and having it in your house when the police come to talk to you is probably not an effective MO for not being caught, is it? But that's part of this, that's part of the pathology they have. That's part of the, the, draw, the need to fulfill that drive. Really, these are pulling, and this is uh, one of the psychologists in the UK had a, had a great analogy. Psychological crime scene analysis, a.k.a. what we used to call profiling, is really like trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have that box to look at. You're not quite sure where all the pieces go together. So how do you know when, you've, when you're finished? Because hopefully when you put them all together without having to jam the pieces in with a hammer, it actually looks like a tree or a boat or a house. And hopefully that's what it's supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be a sports car. But it can be very difficult because you really don't know what the end picture is supposed to look like. The process for psychological crime scene analysis usually goes from, in our case, Collation of case details. Go to the case, what happened? Here, it's really a hybrid approach we're talking about here. We have some theories that we can draw on, but we go to the, we go to the case. Identify uh, salient case points or issues. We have a framework or a theory. That's kind of that, that, that inductive portion. We go through that theory. We apply then those theories, those statistics, to that unique case. We then develop, really, the individual profile, those characteristics we talked about. Again, remember, though, a picture of that person doesn't pop out the other end. In a lot of cases, they might be fairly generic, between 25 and 30 years of age, male, military service, in an occupation that they don't have a lot of contact with people. These are common terms. These are common characteristics you'll see in these profiles. Well, a lot of people fit that, don't they? It hasn't narrowed it down to any specific individual. But now, it's nearly narrowed it down for the investigator. Okay, I don't have to go look for these 50-year-old ex-cons who just got released from prison. I'm going to be, maybe focus my concentration in this group. It might be wrong, but at least I have an area to look at first. I can focus my investigation. 
Let's look at the identification of salient issues or points. This is really key. If we get this wrong, the rest kind of is moot. And we'll talk about that in, in a couple slides. Just keep that in the back of your mind. It's about getting, looking at the proper things. And we're pretty good at doing that in the physical world. We've had a lot of experience, a lot of history. I'd argue that the same stuff is there in the digital world. We just don't have as much experience in going through this. So let's look at how do we use this? Is, is it really relevant to talk about using something that is, I remember I said it was an art or a science. Yeah, a little vague on that. Is there any use using this, transporting this, repurposing it from the physical to the cyber? And I'd argue, yes, there is. So can we use traditional profiling techniques with non-traditional crimes? Some would argue that even right now, these cyber crimes are fairly non-traditional. Non-traditional in the aspect is these, these individuals have decided to express their deviant behavior by using technology with the computer targeted, maybe a little bit with the computer assisted. The computer incidental, that's not what we're looking at here. What kind of questions do investigators need? What kind of questions do they need to answer? What are they going to ask? What information do they need? Are there different questions you ask for a cyber crime as opposed to a physical crime? Yes and no. The framework is, about, is the same, but obviously it's going to be questions that are couched in technology, questions related to or in the context of that specific case. And really, before we reinvent the wheel, do we already have some of these attacker profiles already developed? Can we go out to the, to the literature and say, oh, great, what do we know so far? And in fact, we can in, in at least a couple of cases. And really, in the physical world, we have an identifiable crime scene. If somebody was to come into this room, pull out a gun, and shoot me in the foot, where's my crime scene? This room. We have an identifiable crime scene. How about if somebody came into the room, or how about if somebody basically launched a, an attack on me and planted a virus on my computer? Where's my crime scene now? We'll say it's this laptop. Is it an identifiable crime scene? Sure it is. That's a laptop. I can physically see it. I have a digital crime scene that exists within a physical. Now, if that same person came in and shot me in the foot and took off out of the room and got caught, basically sitting over in the PMU having a latte by Starbucks, where's my secondary crime scene? Or my secondary scene? The Starbucks. Okay. Let's say that uh, we were able to trace this back to the source. And the source was somebody, I'm Canadian, the source was somebody up in Canada who was bored because it was so cold they couldn't go outside. <laughs> and they, and that, that was the source of the attack. Where's, where is my now my secondary scene? Canada. I've got a, it was a computer system. I got a computer system, right? I have a physical, but I have a digital. I have the information inside. So there are some similarities. There are some differences, mind you, because somehow between Canada and here, that the, what was the attack vector? How did they get there? More than likely, how did they get from Canada to here to attack my system? They didn't walk. What did they do? Internet, right? And in the internet, they probably took 10, 12, 15 hops. 15 different nodes it had to go through. Oh, are any of those potential scenes? Do you think there's any information that might be relevant on any one of those hops in between? Yeah, there might. And how basically do I protect that crime scene? So although it's similar, we still have to be aware that there are some subtle differences. For our purposes, though, we're going to consider the primary scene and the secondary scene. We can identify it. We can see it. Even if it's in a log file, we can touch it, we can see it, we can go out and look at it. Although we might have to look at electronic, we can still see that information. In fact, there are some, there has been some research done on attacker profiles, for lack of a better term. Internet child pornography, there is a body of literature out there looking at, okay, who makes up this group? What are their unique characteristics? We have categories like producers. We have categories like basically a curious collector. We have categories like hardcore collector. And because of the fact that these individuals have come to the attention of authorities through the different sting operations, through the different news media shows that do their own sting operations, through the fact that probably a good 60 if not 80 percent of law enforcement effort in cyberspace is based on child pornography, we have a wealth of data there. 
And we're starting to see these patterns. We're starting to see things. We're starting to see characteristics. We're starting to see unique or discriminant characteristics popping up, which allows us to put people, pigeonhole them into these different groups. Say, oh, here's what you need to look for. Internet stalkers, we're seeing it with that. Internet predators. Hackers, not so much. We're starting to look at that. Virus writers, cyber terrorists, and criminal insiders. We're starting to see work in this area identifying characteristics, behaviors, traits that allow us now to start saying, hmm, okay, we may be able to differentiate between one type, one group versus another. Well, what question does an investigator need answered in cyberspace, in cyber crimes? Well, guess what? It's usually case specific. What kind of an offender? They may want to know, is this person experienced? Is this person inexperienced? Is this an individual versus a group? Why would that be important? Why would you want to know if it's an individual or a group? Yes? Uh, funding. funding, yeah, exactly. All of a sudden it moves from your kind of your one-off person to maybe organized crime. So that becomes an important. Are you going to see I, those two cases, those two contexts are slightly different, right? You want to look at those different. Sometimes you'll get these threats. In the UK, there was, an, there was basically a really subtle extortion ring. They'd go around claiming to have placed child pornography on servers of businesses, phone the businesses up and say, hey, you either pay us X amount of money or we'll tell the police and release it to the press that you have child porn on your servers. And by the way, this isn't traceable. You can't prove that you didn't do it. When I first heard that, I, I kind of laughed, and some of my friends over in Europol said, no, they're paying. The companies are paying. Which makes me wonder what they actually had on there in the first place. But they're paying. So when you get these threats, when you get these individuals or these groups or these organizations threatening to do something, what's important is will they act on these threats? Somebody comes on as a member of, of one of the, the terrorist groups and says, we are going to do X to the internet. We're going to take it down. We're going to take the, you know, all 13 of the DNS primary rudders out. We're going to crash the whole thing. Well, is this just somebody blowing smoke? Or does this individual or individuals have the capability of doing it? Will they act on it? That becomes important. Hopefully, when somebody gets caught or somebody gets brought in for an interview, it becomes important to understand, how do you talk to these people? How do you approach the interview and interrogation process? Do you attack it like the father confessor? Oh, you know, tell me your sins. I want to hear this. That's one school of thought that works. The other is, do you want to basically buddy up to them? Oh, I can understand it. Oh, yes, what you did wasn't so bad. Oh, yeah, you know. Which, which actual method, which strategy do you use? If you use the wrong one, you won't get anything out of somebody. If you use the right one, quite often, they will tell you a lot of information. So that becomes extremely important. As I mentioned, there are some, there is a body of literature that's starting to evolve related to these different groups. What's really interesting, though, is, is looking at that kind of that generic group, that hacker group we talked about. And this is where it's a little gray. Obviously, one of the issues of dealing with hackers or computer criminals in general is really it's, a, it's an ill-defined category, isn't it? The term hacker or computer criminal doesn't necessarily refer to a homogeneous group, does it? Who are we talking about? Are we talking about somebody that's a script kitty, somebody that's just new at this? Or are we talking about somebody that's being funded by a large organization, a professional criminal, or a terrorist group? They're both using technology. They both fall under this rubric of a, of a computer criminal. But I'd argue they have distinct characteristics, the motivations, the training, the experience, the funding. Their ability to actually act on their threats is, is different. So one of the things that's required is looking at, we've got to have some kind of a model to work with. We need to develop what's called a taxonomy. And really, a taxonomy is nothing more than a way of separating a large group into smaller groups so you can have some type of discussion. It's not the be-all, live-all, end-all. It's a way of starting a discussion. One taxonomy, and this is one of the taxonomies that we've been developing, which actually has some utility we found, is something called the circumplex model. There's two types. There's the circumplex, which is a way of representing some very complex relationships. Quite often you'll see these things called the continuum, right? There's a continuum with somebody at this end, somebody at the other end, and somebody is slightly in between either a zero or a ten. There's somewhere on that continuum. The problem with the continuum 
is a continuum is unidimensional. It usually allows you to express really only one relationship, right? One variable. The nice thing about a circumplex model is it becomes two-dimensional. It allows you to show interactions. It allows you to show some more complex relationships. You have an ordered circumplex where the position at a specific uh, uh, spot on that model I'll show you has a specific meaning. You have the modified where actually now you have the x and the y now mean something completely different depending upon what characteristics you have mapped to those. It's really also a very good method for eyeballing the fit of a model because that's what we're dealing with now. We're trying to develop a model that has some investigative utility. One way to develop a good model is you eyeball it. You look at it. Does this make sense? Have I got gaps? Have I got holes? Have I got everybody clustered over here and nobody in these other quadrants? The, 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 basically, the hacker circumplex, for, a, for lack of a better term, was basically based, it was based on a meta-analysis of previous research that's been done. So basically, we went back and we looked. What's been done to date? What's the current state of the research? What models do we have? What is anecdotal based and what is actually evidence based? What is based on actual research that can hold up to basically empirical scrutiny? And two primary components popped out when, you went through, when we went through the, the, the literature. Skill and motivation. And for the most part, skill used to be on kind of a continuum from no skill to high skill. Motivation then we were able to break into what we call four high level domains. And really, we looked at eight types. Obviously, this is not the end point. It's merely a starting point. What we have in this picture, then, is a, the hacker circumplex. You've got the four quadrants, which in indicate basically the motivation. Was the motivation revenge? Was it financial? Was it curiosity? Was it notoriety? What motivation did that person have? Obviously, only having four is a, is a little simplistic. But these popped out as basically the, the if you looked at the, at the factor analysis, these popped out as the four primary areas, the four primary types of motivation. Within there, then, you have the pluses. should be pluses and minuses. Minus the closer you are to the origin, the less your skill is. The farther you're out from the origin, the higher your skill level is. And the groups that got broken into this are novices, cyberpunks, petty thieves, virus writers, old guard hackers, professional criminals, information warriors, political activists, and the political activist has a kind of a question mark. We're not sure if that's an actual category or that's just your typical cyberpunk hiding under the, the moniker of, oh, I'm, I hacked that website for a political reason. It's a little dubious right now. But basically, using this model, you get an idea of where those individuals might, might be. Remember this model when we talk about investigations in a second. Remember I talked about those salient points, right? In that chart, as we had that methodology we went through, we started here, we worked our way down. At the other end, it was going to pop out this, hopefully, uh, a little bit more than, a little bit less than an absolute picture of who that person is, and a little bit more than everybody that uses cyberspace. We want to be able to narrow it down to at least a reasonable amount of individuals. So the salient points are those elements that are necessary to do the following. Answer the investigative questions. Build that picture of the perpetrator. Allow us to start putting those pieces, those jigsaw pieces together. Allow us to say, ah, this is actually, you know, this actually is the border on the right-hand corner. If you've ever done jigsaw puzzles, you always want to start with the, with the edges, right? The constant colors, the constant backgrounds. Same, same thing here. But are there, well, we've talked about the physical, and most of the research has talked about the use of these salient case points with the physical. How about in the cyber? Do we have analogous elements between the physical and the cyber? And the research has shown, the research we've done, and, the, and some of the work shows, yes, we do. We have analogous salient case points. But we have to know where to look from them. We have to look, know where to look for them. Where do you look in a computer system? Where do you look in, in a log? Where do, you, where do you look for this information in the digital? And that becomes the challenge. What's needed then is really a basic understanding of technology and, for the most part, the Internet. Because that is really the crime scene that we're dealing with here. Also, you have to remember, when we're doing crime scene analysis of any type, especially now with cyber crimes, we actually have two types of cases we're dealing with. 
Type 1 is where you have an unknown perpetrator, an unknown suspect. An example of that would be a hacking case. You may not know who's hacked you. You just had basically your IDS system's been tripped, and you know that something's happened. Your job then is to do a backtrack, right? You want to do a root cause analysis, what happened, trace back to, to whom, whom did it. You don't start off knowing who that individual is or individuals are. Type 2 is basically your known. This would be your known perpetrator. Somebody has taken their system into Best Buy and the tech has found hundreds of pictures of child pornography on that system. Well, you know who the system belonged to, right? You now have an identifiable individual. You're now going to be treating that case differently. When I use the example, people smirk. I tell you right now, the vast majority of individuals who get caught for child pornography, that's how it happens. They take their systems in for repairs, and the repair people call the police. It's, it's a real interesting phenomenon. Part of those characteristics we talked about in, with, with pedophiles who use technology. There's, there's some interesting things. That is another lecture. Well, let's look at these crime scene uh, elements. And I'm, oh, that really shows up well, I hope. Really, if you're looking at conventional crime elements, the first column is conventional, the second column is equivalent cybercrime, and the third is really the narrative. Why is this important? I'll just go through a couple of these. Conventional crime element, you have selection of a victim, right? That, that scenario where somebody came in and shot me, I'm the victim, right? You can identify the victim. You could actually ask questions about, well, what did you do beforehand? Do you know this individual? What, what at-risk behaviors have you been involved in? Does this person have a grudge against you? Does anybody hate you? Is it a grad student that you didn't pass? You know, what's going on? Well, how about on the cybercrime side? Take a server that's been attacked by a piece of malware. Who's our victim here? Or what is our victim? At least one of our victims. The server itself, right? That's analogous to the victim. What information can we get about that? Just knowing that it's a, a particular type of system. Identifying the victim. It's this server that was attacked. That goes a long way. Now we know where the crime scene is, right? Now we know where to cue in on. Let's look at characteristics. I talked about that victimology. Characteristics of the victim. I mentioned their at-risk behaviors, where I've gone, what I've done, who holds a grudge. Again, that server being our digital victim, what information might be pertinent about that? How about if it was a workstation? Is it a server? What type of server? What type of operating system is it running? Who did it belong to? A business. Did it belong to the military? Did it belong to a government agency? Why would that be important, understanding the characteristics at that level? What are we trying to do here? And I'll argue that each one of us in this room that has done anything related to incident response has gone through this process. We just haven't articulated it. We haven't formalized it. What are we trying to do? Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. What else? Fingerprinting. We're trying to build a picture of who that person at the other end is, aren't we? This individual only attacked, this individual specifically attacked this Windows server. And they went after the web server. That gives us an idea. OK, we're looking at an individual who attacks Windows systems and IIS 6, let's say. That's a lot of information. More information than we had beforehand, right? Let's help us narrow it down. Something that's really becoming important now is the concept of forensic evidence at the scene. As more and more of these CSI shows are out there, as more and more stuff is happening, as we do lectures like this, as we talk about computer forensics and anti-forensics, we're actually falling into the risk of actually educating those people we're trying to catch. Understanding what forensic knowledge that individual has can be extremely important. In the physical world, gee, we know that this is apparently where the, where the crime scene is. There's no blood. There's bleach, but there's no blood. What might that tell you? They cleaned it up. Sure. How about on the computer side? The old trick they used to do with the Trojan horses. What was one of the, the any Trojan horse script worth its weight? They used to do what? Go and clean the log files, right? 
the, the, the really uh, cludged ones would go in and wipe the log file out. So it became obvious that, oh, get, wait a minute, there's no log file and there should have been. The more devious ones would go out and surgically remove entries. Try to figure out when that happens if there's anything suspicious. So basically, for forensic evidence to the scene becomes extremely important as well. So yes, there are analogous elements. There are analogous case points. There are these nine, and that nine, nine questions are really the questions that majority of the investigators look at. That when, you, that when you're doing any type of psychological crime scene analysis, whether it be in the physical or the digital, these are the nine basic questions that you want to at least have some answers to. And in the research and in, in the practical things we've done, we've shown that we can, we can answer at least those nine, if not m many more. So there is some utility. The, the, basically, the psychological digital crime scene analysis uses reduces the pool of potential suspects. Gee, just like we did in the physical world, right? Focuses the investigation. Rather than focus the investigation, like in the physical world, to a particular uh, area, geographical area, this is like doing geographical profiling within the digital space, within the file system. Look in these directories. Look in these particular areas with these individuals that are involved in child pornography. They tend to stick the files in a certain area. They tend to name their directories in a certain way. They, they tend to follow a bit of a theme when they're doing this. They will actually list directories like really bad pictures, boys under 10, toddlers. Why would they do that? If somebody saw that, they're going to go, oh my gosh, look at this. They don't think anybody's ever going to see it. And it's part of their characteristics of being very uh, precise in how they list things and what they do with this. Provide insight into the technical ability. Why would that be important? Why would it be important to look at the technical ability of that individual? Why is that of any, any relevance to us? To see if they could have used uh, tools like steganography to hide more pictures. Or sure. Are they, you know, are, are they basically doing a staging? And what can, what can help is some of, these, some of those nine points we talked about before allows you to go back to that circumplex and say, it looks like they were motivated by revenge because, look, here's the, here's the script they used. They basically, when they got on there, they sent messages to the system administrator taunting them, saying, I own you. That's what you get for firing me. They do silly things like that. You'll never guess who I am. I'm much smarter than you. Well, that, that allows me to indicate that they're probably motive within those four, within that quadrant is probably revenge, right? And you look at the fact that they use a script or they use some type of uh, attack that went out and you only had Windows systems and you saw in the logs it was uh, trying to enumerate for Unix. It was basically doing every attack under the sun. What would you think about that person's technical ability? Probably low, right? They're running a script and they have no idea even how to modify the script to only do what they want it to do. So you've got somebody that's revenge motivated, low skill. You can now map them within that circumplex. Now you can go back and say, oh, and by the way, once we have enough data points, hopefully at some point, these are other characteristics that follow from that. Current cases that we've used this circumplex model with this psychological digital crime scene analysis, we've actually done something called fast cyber forensics triage where rather than do the traditional, where you take the, the evidence, you take the system back to the lab and work on it there, there's certain cases, child abductions, at risk, where you don't have the luxury. You haven't got two or three days to take it back to your lab. It's done on scene, it's done quickly, it's done in a relatively short period of time. You have a technician actually sitting in a unit, in a van, in a mobile home outside that, that, that individual's house that you're investigating, you have the investigators inside doing the interview and interrogation. You have the forensics people in the van basically looking for information to feed back to the investigators. It's very important at that point you have a narrow focus, right? And you realize, wait a minute, this person isn't just a recreational collector of child pornography. They are a hardcore producer. There are children at risk now. So those type of cases, we've been very successful with it. The, uh, the U.S. Assistant District Attorney's Office has been looking at this model, Indiana State Police. Child porn investigations in general, fraud. We've had fraud cases where it's the ability to geographically profile within that operating system, within that file system, where the biggest hit might be, where we might look for this information, extremely useful. 
the days of being able to look at every bit on a system are gone. Too much information, too narrow a period of time. The tools aren't really, the algorithms that are out there for searching haven't grown with the size of drives. When I first, first started doing investigations, a 10 meg drive meant you were a power user. Oh my gosh, you had 10 megs of storage. Now you get, what, 500 gigs, terabyte? And unfortunately, the tools have not basically evolved to keep up with that advance. So you haven't got time to look at every bit. You need to focus the investigation. It's also been used in cases with online predatory offenders. In this case, it's been used for what's going to push their button. How do you make yourself, you're the, you know, the 40-year-old you know, grizzled police officer, how do you look like the 14-year-old confused cheerleader whose parents don't understand them? Well, I'll tell you, these guys online are very, very good at figuring out whether somebody is a decoy. You need to know the speech, the language. You need to know how to deal with it. You need to know those characteristics, those traits, those things they're looking for. So these are all areas right now that it, this is actually being used for. So in summary then, the psychological digital crime scene analysis is an effective investigative tool. It's not the only tool that investigators should have in their arsenal, but it is an extra tool that I would argue, prior to this, we haven't really thought about. Or if we have, we haven't been doing it formally. There are identifiable crime scene elements in that cyber crime scene as well. So not only do we have the elements in the physical that we can use, and we've been fairly effective with the crime scene analysis there, psychological, we have the analogous ones in the cyber world. But we need to know what to look for. And whether we like it or not, this is an area that's not going away. Digital evidence is here to stay. It's not going to decrease. It's only going to increase. So this is something that law enforcement can't ignore. It's something that scientists can't ignore. It's something that information security professionals can't ignore. We're all going to be intertwined, and it's, it's going to get even more synergistic and le and as opposed to less. So it's important that we at least understand that there are these things that we can do. I always like this, uh, this little quote here. I'll end with this. If you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. I think that goes without saying, and this is really what we're trying to do here. Sun Tzu, the art of war. Questions or comments? Anybody awake still? No questions? No comments? Just trying to sink in? Yeah, Bill. Oh, the business with the Naval War College and the Chinese intelligence and stuff. Uh, do we know anything about that using these techniques? How to Intelligence or yeah, the intelligence and, and uh, intelligence agencies are really looking at this at this hard uh, because one of the big things that they're having trouble with, and this goes back to what was it, the uh, late '90s? I think the late '90s was early early 2000 when they had those attacks that were really those two kids being coached by that individual from Israel, and they really thought at that point this was the first indication. They actually thought it was a cyber attack. And so they, they thought they were actually ready to push, you know, to go to DEFCON 1 for cyberspace. Turned out, luckily, that it was two kids messing around, getting tutored by this, uh, this, this individual in Israel that had some fairly decent skills. Luckily, some cooler heads prevailed because they were ready to, to say, this is it, shut the internet down, block us off, this is, you know, the Pearl Harbor of cyberspace is actually hit. Luckily, when they, they stopped and, and stood back and went, ah, I don't know, it turned out to be now. How embarrassing would that have been to do this when it was two kids? But if you think about it, the, the, the early part of an attack, how do you differentiate two kids from Southern California doing something from an actual cyber warfare attack? And where do you err on the side of caution? Part of doing this is being able to say, hey, wait a minute here. Let's look at the details. Let's look at the context. Let's look at what's happening. Let's put all this information in and see, does this fit? Is this a group? Is this somebody that's highly funded? Are these individuals? Are these highly skilled? It turned out they were just using a, a tool this guy had created for them, which was pretty easy to see in hindsight. So yeah, this, it's become extremely important. There's indications that some of the malware that was released during certain periods of time over the past couple of years may have been really a true intelligence gathering, or let's see if we release this, let's see what the reaction is. 
the precursor for kind of, you know, what's coming? Is this, is this the first wave? Is it the thin edge of the wedge for an actual cyber attack? So, yeah. And it becomes important in those cases. When do you actually basically pull the plug on everything and shut down the entire government because it's actually the real tax happened? No more questions or comments? Thank you very much. <laughs>